Uh, tonight, we're going to look at the proposed city code amendments, and uh, we'll have Heather. Uh, she sent her slides out to you in your email if you want to follow from that perspective. The code um, amendments were a part of your packet, and they've been also passed out to you um, at the dais. And so, Heather and group, welcome. Nick, it's good to see you. Go ahead, Heather. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. I wanted to, tonight we're going to talk about code compliance um, and community relations. And I wanted to start off with by introducing you to our two code compliance officers, Nick Miles and Claudia Martinez. We are at our six month sort of dashboard in terms of the code compliance program coming over to planning. Uh, I'd come to you in June of last year and talked a little bit about that, that transition and what we hope to achieve. So tonight what we, we want to do is come back to you and say what we've been doing over the, next, the last six months and some of the prep work that we're doing in terms of an action item that will come to you in the future um, with a code amendment. So I will lead the discussion to talk through sort of the code amendments and then Claudia and Nick are going to tell you what they've been doing over the last six months. There's a lot of exciting things and then also what they have planned. Hi, I'm Claudia Martinez. Um, I am new to McMinnville. Um, you move the mic a little closer. Hill County. There we go. Um, I was doing foreclosure counseling, and before that, I was doing a little bit of Section 8 waitlist coordinating. And my name is Nick Miles, and I started in September last year. Also new to working with the city uh, prior to. Uh, working here in code compliance, um, had a hodgepodge of jobs, was a photographer, videographer, um, worked around McMinnville, graduated from Linfield College, um, loved town, so I'm excited to be back serving in this capacity. And Claudia, I'm no longer contagious, so you can... <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, so today we do want to talk to you about proposed code amendments that we'll um, be bringing to you and then in the near future and then what our six month update looks like. Uh, the value of code compliance, we talked about a little bit about this last time I came to you, but really it, you know, we spent a lot of work putting plans together for the community in terms of how the community will develop and the, the vision for the community. We have codes that then sort of memorialize those to ensure that they happen. So code compliance is really making sure that our community vision moves forward and um, continues to operate as everyone originally envisioned it. I like to think of it as it's a good neighbor playing in the sandbox by the same set of rules and program for everybody's benefit. So we're all playing in that same sandbox together. Um, so the proposed code amendments uh, in front of you tonight are something that we brought to you in our presentation on June 26, 2000, or I did, because we I hadn't been lucky enough to hire Claudia and Nick by that time yet, but uh, in June of 2018, and it was a recommendation to move a centralized administrative process forward. So our code enforcement program has been uh, um, a program that's been managed through the court system in terms of bringing uh, properties to compliance that weren't brought to compliance in a voluntary manner. We thought there might be a way to do it slightly different than that that would be more efficient and save resources and yield faster compliance if we brought it into an administrative program. Um, it relies still on voluntary compliance. That's the, always the goal. And then the the tools to get to uh, compliance if voluntary compliance is not possible is the ability to issue administrative citations and then also do administrative abatements. Currently, it we would cite someone into the court system. They would come into the court system and stand before a judge. Our counsel would be there as well, as well as the officer. And there would be a hearing and some sort of decision from that in terms of how to move forward. That's a fairly lengthy process. It takes a lot of resources in terms of staff time to move a case through the court system. We have one case that has been in the court system for many years, um, recently working towards resolution, but has taken a lot of city resources to get there. And so we think that this may be a more efficient program to manage. 
In June, we said we would evaluate the codes for nuisances and code compliance issues. We would amend the municipal code to create this administrative process. We would create a centralized program in the planning department. So prior to that, it was a little decentralized. Every department was responsible for their own code enforcement program. And then we would develop a community relations program. So that's what we said we would do. We're gonna to talk to you tonight about how we've done that. The goal is again, still voluntary compliance. And we expect to do that through education, information, communication, and relationships. That, that is 90% of what we're trying to achieve. There will be the non-voluntary compliance issues, which we will work through um, with a goal of full cost recovery for the city when we go into abatement. So the process itself that we're bringing to you in these proposed um, code amendments is to bring compliance into a timely manner. <laughs> See, I am so glad someone gets my humor out. <laughs> Welcome, Zach. <laughs> so um, the time frame is a 21-day test. That's what I talk a lot about is this 21-day test. How do we get what's not in compliance into compliance within 21 days? And the code before you tonight is written in such a way to get us there. It's based on two 10-day markers and then the final day being abatement if it hasn't been abated by then. So the first 10 days is when we're notified of a potential um, situation being non-compliant, we send a letter and we ask for voluntary compliance. So we identify there could be an issue. Do you agree? If you agree, let's mitigate the issue, take care of it. Um, and hopefully in, within that 10 days, a lot of people don't even know they don't, that they're out of compliance. If they don't know and want to comply, they'll get into compliance just with that initial letter. We'll then go back in 10 days. If we haven't gotten them to compliance, that's when we'll go into this judicial process where we will send a certified letter and post the property and let them know that you have 10 days to get into compliance. If you don't, we will abate it. If we abate it, we will invoice you for the cost and lien the property if you're not if you don't pay back that invoicing for the full cost recovery. Um, and so it gets into a much more serious discussion. At this time as well, we could go into a citation process. We could also say, you know, based on what's happening, we are willing to cite you and we could cite you daily as well as get into this abatement process. And then by day 21, presumably, we're in abatement of some means. So either they've done it or we are going to do it. So it gets us to a, a time frame of within 21 days of abating whatever is not in compliance. The structure of the code in front of you tonight, the intent behind that was to simplify our nuisance um, chapter. The nuisances were in our municipal city code in many different places. Um, in chapter eight, they were somewhat disparate in there as well. What we wanted to do was bring them all together, identify what they were, and then line them up into this sort of streamlined process so that the whatever we did in terms of notification and abatement, it was the same primarily for all the nuisances. If there's a public safety issue, we do have the ability to move quicker than that 21 day test. Um, and then we wanted to be able to allow for the citation. So you'll see that in the code as well. What we did to get here is we reviewed the existing code and we talked about modernizing it. So we had code in there that talked a lot about barns and stables and, um, you know, uh, what would be out of compliance with barns and stables in the city of McMinnville. We don't have a lot of barns and stables in the city of McMinnville anymore. So you'll note that that's, that's no longer part of the code. Uh, we had something in the code that talked about noises, but um, so you couldn't make noise to sell goods except for newsboys could yell on the corner to sell the newspaper. So we removed that from the code too. Um, and just got into a, a more modernized um, way of approaching it by saying there are levels of metrics for what is a nuisance. So for noise, we put metrics in there. If it's exceeding this, that would be the, um, that would be what exceeds the, the nuisance level. We then research best practices in comparable cities. So we do this as a norm in the planning department. We have a, a normal list of eight cities that we look at that we see as comparable to McMinnville and we look at what they're doing and ask what's working, what's not working. Uh, Claudia and Nick have also been going to both state and national code enforcement conferences for training and have created their own network and resources. And so they've been using that as well and bringing those tools to the table. Um, I sh should note that the 
document that I sent out to you did have a reference in it to one of our comparable cities, Redmond. Um, and so what you have with you tonight, I actually deleted that reference. What we, we brought all these best practices together, we aggregated them, we talked about them, um, and that what meant, was not meant to carry forward in the code and it did inadvertently, so I apologize for that. Um, we met with the judge who uh, in the municipal court system is overseeing our code enforcement program today and sat down and talked about how can we, this is what we want to do. We want to streamline it. What makes sense from your perspective? Are we approaching this in the right way? Uh, we still want to retain a relationship with that judge. And so we had a discussion about what that would look like um, from a judicial um, position. And then we amended the code for objectivity. So there's a lot of language of, in there of, you know, too much noise is too much noise. Well, how, how do you defend that? And so we wanted to bring the objectivity into the code. I do want to let you know there's still review needed on the code. It, it does need to be re reviewed internally by the different city departments. And so I will get that out to everyone. And then legal counsel does need to review it as, as well. So we're bringing it to you just so, to sort of show you what we're thinking to get major feedback on any sort of larger fatal flaws you see in the process because the code will continue to tweak and be refined until we bring you a final product for an ordinance consideration. The outline for the code is we have initially described all the nuisances um, in one section. We have a general section of nuisances. We have nuisances affecting public health. That's an important section because that's where we may move in a quicker manner. Um, we have attractive nuisances. Uh, Claudia and Nick will talk to you a little bit about that, but that's nuisances that are attracting children that could be um, creating safety issues. And then we have nuisances associated with animals. <clears throat> we consolidated all those codes. Some example of it is we had fence language in three different sections of the McMinnville City Code. We were constantly looking through all the sections when people were asking about fences. We brought it all together as one. Uh, where it made sense from a nuisance perspective. We consolidated the animal codes as well. We had those in many different sections. Uh, we added metrics to the unnecessary noise. We added two sections I wanted you to be aware of. So most of what's in there in terms of nuisances are things that have been historically in our code, um, but we added a section that talks about parking and storage of vehicles in front yards and side yards that are not in driveways or on, uh, are on turf. We've had a lot of complaints about that over the last six months. Claudia and Nick, as they've been out, have been um, talking to people. And so um, we looked at what other communities were doing in that regard, and we've brought to you a recommendation that if people want to park cars in their front yard outside of their driveway, that they should have some sort of delineated surface for that. It could be gravel, asphalt, or concrete. Um, and that not the whole yard could be encumbered in that way. That is something I want to bring to you and get feedback from you on. And then we also had another section in the code that was trash recycling and yard debris containers. That is a request from Recology in terms of uh, the containers that they provide and how long they are left out on the curb or in the street. So we have in the code that it can be left out for 24 hours before pickup, 24 hours after pickup, but not the whole week. And interestingly enough, we fielded a couple of calls about that today, um, people calling. The next part of the code, which is the process for abating, is that we identify how we can I uh, how do we identify nuisances? I want to point out to you in this language that there is language that we'll do it from a complaint basis, but we'll also do it in a proactive way too. And that's one of the, the programs that Nick and Claudia are going to talk to you about tonight. And I wanted to make sure that was transparent and in the code. Um, and then we talk about what the nuisance abatement procedure will be. We'll notice the property owner as I described to you. And then the owner can abate it or the city can abate it, abate it with a warrant that's been approved by the judge. Or the city can approve it without a warrant based on what's described in the code. Um, and what's described in the code is that we need to abate it because it's a public safety issue. And the judge is, the, that is language that was recommended by the judge when we sat down and met with him. Um, we will look for full cost recovery on the abatement cost. So that means we're going to look at the indirect cost allocation plan. It's not going to just be whatever we pay the vendor to abate the weeds. It will be the cost of staff involved in the processing of it. So it is truly cheaper for the property owner to do it themselves. 
Um, and then there's appeal to process in there with a hearings officer. Um, and then we also identify that there, we violations will be considered continuing violations on a daily basis from a citation perspective if we need to go into that. We have provided citation authority and created three different sets of violations, A, B, and C, and have assigned different nuisances into those three sets of violations. And presumably we would pass a fee schedule that identifies the costs associated with those. Um, I put in the staff recommendation, staff report recommendations of class A being 500, class B 250, and class C $100. That's what we are finding in other communities for those. So with that, I wanted to see if there were any questions relative to the proposed code amendments that are in front of you tonight. I have some. Hmm? Um, so on, in the um, definitions, 8.020.015, um, number four, noxious weeds. It says include, but are not limited to those varieties listed in 2018 Oregon Department Agriculture Noxious Weed Policy and Classification System. And I was wondering um, if, um, I was questioning whether it made sense to identify a year or to have that being the, the most current um, identification by the ODA. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great suggestion. And I'm also sure it's probably one our legal counsel account to catch as well when we go through this, but yes. Okay. Thank you, we'll do that. Um, the second one um, that I had uh, concerns over was the entire section on bees, um, uh, 8.020.022, it's page 15 in, um, here. Um, my concerns about the, the bees being listed as an animal nuisance are... Um, um, multi-tiered. Um, one, um, you, you know, I, I think there's some generally accepted knowledge that we need uh, bees. We have collapsing colonies. Um, so viewing these as a nuisance or wanting them out of the city um, when our very food is dependent on them, um, I think is a, an a, approach that, uh, that I question. Um, and then if I uh, if, there, if it was compelling that there needed to be some um, code enforcement around bees, to me what's in here seems kind of uh, either very restrictive in some areas, for instance, the, um, uh, the setbacks are stricter than um, building code setbacks for, or, you know, for most uh, development and, um, and the necessity of fences and it just seems uh, kind of overly strict and then part of it also seems unreasonable to me as we get down into F1 um, an individual who is allergic to bee stings shall file with the city police a medical certificate attesting to his allergy and shall provide information concerning the location of the beehive or colony and its distance from his property um, to me, that seems like a too far of a step and, and, and kind of an unreasonable step to think that um, somebody would, would need to file with the, the city if they had a, a bee allergy. So um, I, would, I would propose that the entire section on bees was, was struck, and if not struck, that it was um, greatly revised. So from what I so this is all language that existed in the code. From what I understand, this is where the allowance to have bees comes from. There's no other section of the code that would allow bees in the city of McMinnville. And what this does is it sort of prescribes how it is allowed. And if you exceed that allowance, that's where it becomes a nuisance. So it talks about no more than three bee colonies and things of that nature. Um, if we struck it entirely, bees would not be allowed in the city of McMinnville. That's, and, and most of what you see in this animal section is relative to intensity, I guess is the way I would describe it, and um, how much or how um, often you can have these different types of animals in different areas. Um, I haven't looked at this actual bee um, language. I understand from um, the planning department staff that this was fairly controversial when it was brought forward and put together. 
Um, we can look at it and see if it's similar to other communities. Just looking at it really briefly, it reads very similarly to what I've seen in other communities. The discussion about the medical certificate, if, is, if somebody lives next to a, a neighbor that has a bee colony, that they, and they're nervous about it, that that's when they would come to the police department and file their certificate. So that there's awareness from a safety perspective. I can give some background on that because I was on the planning commission at the time. We had a significant amount of testimony, both in favor of having bees in town and people really concerned about the medical issues associated with them. So this was a compromise that came out of a lot. Not saying that we can't amend it, but it might be something that, that people have a lot of input into if it's changed significantly. So I think that that medical part came out of trying to help um, people who have allergies or sensitivities feel comfortable and with the ordinance being in there. But we can do a best practice review, though, if okay. that makes sense. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I would ask the, that we kind of review, review it almost entirely. I mean, A, B, D, F. Let's see if we can. Uh, yeah, be, uh, especially when it comes to some of the setbacks seem, seem to be, to me, anyways, they seem... Um, uh, to be too grand, um, and we get bigger. I mean, yeah. And and then my last um, concern was having to do with um, construction debris, um, which is number eighteen. Page eighteen. It's on page thirteen. Number Thank you. 18. So that was my concern. There was specific to the dust and debris. Um, in the the eighteen, the first line reads: No debris of any kind, including dirt, dust, sand, or other windborne material, shall, shall for any reason progress beyond the perimeter of any property that is being developed for construction or where construction is in progress. So, in theory, I I, I love I I agree with the sentiment of that. Um, and then in practice, I wonder how can you stop dust from a construction site uh, from blowing in the wind? So the, it's not that I think the intent is bad. Um, I, I also have that question. How do you stop that from? Yeah, so that's just a, a practical question of, of um, you know, not putting something in the code that's then not really enforceable without con shutting down a construction site for um, Yes, so we'll look at best practices for that. I think that is, um, we've done enforcement on this actually. We've had calls from neighbors who have been impacted by construction on properties next to them where the construction debris was migrating onto their property and we did go into code enforcement on it um, and it was rectified. In terms of the objectivity of the language, we can look at strengthening that. Yeah, there's all sorts of erosion control measures that you can put in place that are already written. Yeah, and we we do have public work standards already for constructability of sites and things of that nature and wetting them down in different conditions. But erosion control specific for like, uh -huh. oh, you got to go out there and protect the storm drains and, uh -huh. and the other? Okay. Um, but yeah, we could look at that. Okay, thank you. Those were my three thoughts. Zach? Um, not a specific line in here, but maybe something that wasn't in here that is a process question I have is when you get to a abatement, who authorizes and or prescribes the abatement? Does that question make sense? So you have a 36 inch we weeds out there or whatever, who says, okay, yes, we're going to hire the landscaper to go out there and cut them. So that, that would be, we will have the code says yes, because it's not discretionary anymore because it says 10 inches. Um, so if the property owner does not comply, then the code enforcement, the code compliance officer, either Nick or Claudia, have the authority to say, okay. and it's based on what's written in the code, it will say the city manager or designee, and the designee is the two code compliance officers, have the ability to say, okay, we need to get a vendor in here, and they will have a, a um, Pre, um, the, we'll go through a procurement process to create a list of competitive vendors that we will use for different things. That was my other question: was what's the procurement process for hiring that in each case? But there'll be a preferred list of yes things, mm -hmm. people to solve identified problems. Right. 
And so, you're, so to re recap, you're saying that the code compliance, the authority to initiate the abatement process will rest in the code compliance officer? It truly rests in the city manager's oh, okay. authority, and the city manager can designate okay. it. So. Thank you. As written in the code right now. Um, Heather, thank you. Uh, excellent work as, as usual. Um, I had a couple of questions about um, the abatement process. Earlier when you uh, came and talked to us about this previously, you had said that in code compliance we might also look uh, during the abatement process at whether there are any uh, opportunities for community support for people who are struggling like senior citizens who are running into these kinds of issues. Can you explain a little bit yeah, I'm actually going to defer that. So we're halfway through the presentation, and um, Claudia and Nick have th their presentation is all about setting up those community events, okay. um, and and how to do that sort of community relations piece of it. So I want to make sure we're able to get to that. Jump the gun. I'll, uh, That's all right. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Other other very <laughs> technical questions as to things that uh, shouldn't or should be in the code. I have one Go ahead, um, Wendy. question. I'm not sure if it fits in here, but um, when you have you have those time frames, is that a time frame that they the, say it was something that would <clears throat> take a longer period of time for abatement? Is that a time frame in which they need to start and complete, or a time frame that they need to have a plan initiate? What's the what needs to happen? With so the intention is, and, and I'll work with legal counsel to make sure that this allowance is in there. The intention is that the code compliance officer has some discretion in terms of how they work with the property owner. So if the property owner gets back to the code compliance officer and says, I get it, I need to get it done. I'm out of town for six days. Can I get it done by this date? And they agree upon it, that that can be part of the abatement program that they put together. So they could be allowed that time. If mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we'll make sure that there's some language in there that allows that discretion. All right, thanks. Thanks, Wendy. Um, Heather, just a couple of things. Uh, again, very good job. I, when I looked at how thick this was, I'm going, oh, this is my whole afternoon reading. But it read very, very easily, and it was understandable to me. Uh, a couple of things that I'm glad to see under the area of trees, I think it falls right in line with our landscape review committee and the things that we're doing there. Uh, sidewalk, you know, and some of those things. Fences, very detailed. The question I do have, though, is uh, discarded vehicles and parking and storage of vehicles in front and side yards. We've seen a, a, a number of situations within the city where that's been, I think, really hard to enforce for us. I think the specifics that you get into helps us. So I'm going to turn to David and we have a, a, a property on West Side Road that we've been dealing with for a number of about a year now where the vehicles were scattered all throughout the front. Does this give us more opportunity to come in compliance? Um, and, and, and I'm helping I'm helping Kelly, and I think I'm helping uh, Zach so, on so this. So maybe if I lead, you can follow. I was just going to say, I, I haven't gotten far enough along in my review of the proposed ordinance to answer that question, so I would defer to Heather. Oh. Uh, Go ahead, Heather. So the, the existing ordinance, the, the existing city code has a fairly lengthy um, a process for discarded vehicles and it, and it's and it's emblematic of what is occurring in the code today which is nuisances are dealt with in different ways um, so the discarded vehicles is a fairly lengthy it's a fairly convoluted process to get through in terms of getting to full abatement and compliance what we've done is in the recommendation in front of you is we've deleted that whole section and we rewrote it and we we simply said is this is what's considered a nuisance in terms of discarded vehicles. We've made it fairly objective. If the vehicle is this, this, or this, or this, it's a nuisance. If it is a nuisance, you need to take care of it. If you don't take care of it, we will take care of it. And so that's how I read it. And I think it's going to be much more, um, we're going to be much more successful. Yeah, and Claudia and Nick have worked on a couple of these actually situations, and they have some before and after pictures for you where they have been successful with it. I, I did have one other thing, too. I'm sorry that I missed earlier. Um, it was uh, related to barbed wire. Um, and I was just uh, on, on fences, and I was just thinking about um, uh, this, this uh, limits 
barbed wire on a fence if it's uh, along a public right way. And I was just thinking about some of our industrial districts and um, use of barbed wire, especially when they're storing a lot of heavy metals and, and things of that nature. Um, and that there might be some concern from those business owners about losing that uh, uh, security perceived or not. Yeah, so I, I, actually it'd be great to get direction from city council on that. I, uh, Mike Bissett brought the same thing to my attention. This, this is existing language that has been in the code for a long time. Uh, so it's not new language. Um, and the, my um, question to Mike was, how do, how do we deal with this in the past? If it wasn't allowed, why is it allowed and exists? So that, that's a dialogue we need to have. It, our, um, I, historically, code enforcement has been very, uh, has been, uh, my understanding is that it's been primarily complaint driven. Um, so with some of these changes, is this also going, is, is there going to be a change in approach as well? Will, will it still remain fairly complaint driven or will it be? Um, We're gonna do some neighborhood revitalization programs, which we'll share with you. Um, so I can't say it's only going to be complaint driven. The, the proactive approach will be an approach that is sort of a rising tide raises all ships and not targeting an individual property necessarily. Sorry. And the main reason why we want to do an, a proactive approach is that way we know and we really do want to just fairly and equally enforce the, uh, the safety, the health, and the nuisance codes to all of the city of McMinnville and not just certain neighborhoods or not certain homes of where a neighbor is mad at the other and they keep just calling code enforcement and each other. So we just really want to make it citywide equally and fairly. So Mayor, if you don't mind, it looks like we only have about nine minutes left. I wanna make sure Claudia and Nick have an opportunity to share with you what they want to do. So do you guys wanna go? Okay, so um, yeah, like Heather mentioned, we just want to run through um, kind of some um, nuggets of what we've been up to for the last uh, six and a half months. Uh, we're going to share a little bit about how we've structured the program um, internally for Claudia and I to operate and be as available as we can for the citizens. Some case statistics about the types of calls we are receiving, the types of um, code violations we're observing, some uh, pretty great success stories we've had just in the short time we've been operating. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about our uh, uh, community relations programming that Heather had mentioned, and also um, take a look at the calendar of events that and um, focus areas we have for the year. And uh, why code compliance? So um, our main focus is pretty much to improve property values um, code compliance decreases the numbers of attractive nuisances. It improves safety, sense of community, public image, and it also improves quality of life. It reduces health threats. It positively impacts economic development, and it also promotes neighborhood revitalization. So some things that uh, we've uh, gotten off the ground, we have a dedicated phone line set up for code compliance. So that will ring to Claudia. And if she's not available to answer, it'll roll over to me. So now we have one number that we can distribute to anybody that wants information and that'll come to us. So we're trying to, um, trying to defer folks from calling WICOM or the police or fire um, and give them a direct line to get in touch with us, which has been um, a really big help. Uh, we have set up the new code compliance and community relations website. So folks can hop online there. Um, there's a code complaint form uh, on the next slide, I think over. So if someone doesn't feel comfortable calling in or um, you know, letting us know, they can go online and submit if that's what's most comfortable for them. They can upload photos. So that can save us a trip out to do an inspection. Um, and if you go back, one more. Um, we have our proactive patrol uh, mapping and schedule. Um, we've broken the city down into um, five, oh, six sections. So each of those sections is being visited once every two weeks. Uh, we started this uh, about a month ago and it's given us a chance to kind of be out, be more visible, 
um, introduce more folks to the program and, and some of the nuisance violations that they might not have been aware of before. Um, so yeah. And um, some of the examples of non-compliance, um, usually they're animals, um, dogs at large, chickens roaming freely, rats, um, and noise complaints usually come about barking dogs, construction, loud music, nuisance, usually it's uh, junk, rubbish, discarded vehicles, structure, unpermitted structure in buildings, unsafe structures, like for example, old homes that um, no one's currently living in and it, the roof is just sinking in, um, tree removal, uh, when neighbors just randomly go out in the planter strip and remove all the trees. Uh, we've been called for that one. Um, other examples for weeds, noxious vegetation, taller than 10 inches. Other miscellaneous, miscellaneous items would be objects, branches in the right of way political signs, abandoned homes, and this miscellaneous also, um, the garbage cans, leaving them out the full week, um, accumula accumulating garbage, and then cats getting into the garbage cans um, and pulling garbage bags and garbage out of the um, cans. Um, that's actually um, one of my first complaints that I used to receive, and it was um, a little <clears throat> difficult um, to enforce it just because we don't have anything specific for garbage containers being removed in a timely manner. Um, but um, thankfully, we were able to get through that hurdle. So just adding the particular garbage uh, being removed within 24 hours and not being left there all week would definitely be helpful to us to enforce that. So this gives you a bit of a breakdown of the complaints or the compliance issues that we have um, been tackling. As you can see, the, the largest piece of the pie is made up by nuisances, and a lot of that is junk and um, um, accumulation of rubbish. Um, and uh, so some of the other you know, things in that category, we've talked about animals, noise, uh, structure-related issues. Uh, the small piece up there is you know, health-related things. Um, Heather had mentioned that uh, public safety, public health um, cases we try to move pretty quickly on. Fortunately, we haven't had too many yet. Um, and this is uh, some statistics on what we've, uh, what we've processed so far. So you can see, um, I think this goes back to just at the end of last August when Claudia got things off the ground. We've uh, had a total of 158 cases come through the department. And of those 158, we've been able to um, close 122 of them. And that's all through voluntary compliance. So we haven't had to do any abatement. Um, some of those cases, you know, we've had to grant some um, extensions on deadlines like we talked about earlier and you know Claudia and I've been really working hard to um, kind of set deals up with folks that call in if there's you know um, family issues going on traveling holidays weather and we've you know we've had some really great success with you know folks complying with that and holding up their end of the bargain uh, we do have 36 still open um, we we have a lot from the last couple of weeks from doing our proactive approach. So that number would be a little bit lower, but um, we've got a couple extra on our desks to get through. So we'll uh, jump into some success stories. So uh, we had a property that, as you can see on the right, they had a pretty excessive storage situation going on of um, you know materials that typically belong in inside the home as well as um, quite a bit of garbage, um, hoses, you name it. So this is a rental property and we were able to get a hold of the landlord and property owner. And within three weeks, we had the whole property cleaned up and he actually had some service companies inside the uh, duplex you see there. And they did a remodel. Um, from what I could tell, they gutted the inside. So it was great that the work we were able to get them to do on the outside translated into um, some stuff going on inside. 
The next slide is a vacant home. Um, this was a foreclosure, and um, this would be would have been um, an attractive nuisance. Um, so in the back, this pool has an in-ground pool. It didn't have an enclosure. The gates were wide open uh, for children to pretty much come in, come see what we have in the back type thing. Um, and um, the front door, when I approached it, it was wide open as well, inviting in homeless individuals, anyone trying to escape from their parents. Um, inside, of course, there's, um, I don't know what was going inside, if the structure is good, et cetera. And so uh, what I did there is I contacted the field services. Um, unfortunately, those services aren't as fast as we would like them to be, and this would be um, when an administrative warrant would have been great, an administrative abatement, because it did take about two weeks and me calling them every two days to tell them, hey, get on it, you need to lock this. This could attract children. The next door neighbor had three smaller children under the age of 10. Um, I was really scared for their safety for, you know, it had been raining. This was around October, November. Um, any child could have easily just went into the backyard, fallen onto the pool, and you have a tragedy there. So um, after two weeks, the field service um, agency came in, they locked the doors, um, and they locked the gates in the back. Um, this is another one that I took in um, when I first started. Um, when it, for, it moved from the police department to the planning department, and we didn't really know what to do there. The property owner had been sick. Um, through um, a lot of effort, we were able to contact a family member that went in there, uh, mowed the grass, and um, took out the junk that was on the side of the garage. And this is actually the next slide. I'm extremely proud of it, of the work we did. So this is a before and after. Pretty sure they don't look anything alike. It's the same home. Um, this is an individual that um, honestly had no idea that home, his home is in that condition. He doesn't live there. He visits maybe, I don't know, once every few years. Um, so I contact him um, and let him know what was going on, the complaint that came in. Um, he cleaned it. It took um, more effort because he wasn't really happy with the complaint that had came in and having him needed to clean that um, those weeds. Um, but he did um, do extra work on it to clean it up and be in compliance. He, um, he did a great job. And this is another one um, that came in as well. And this is um, another happy ending. Um, the person that called it in, they were trying to sell a home next door. And all of the complaints that she'd received, why people weren't putting offers, was because of the next door neighbor. Um, they were storing um, discarded vehicles um, on the side of the home um, and on the flatbed it had that little pickup had been there forever. Um, they also had a little pool trailer in the uh, planter strip. Um, you're really not allowed to store things there. Um, and so I contacted them, their tenants, um, and I worked with the landlord and the tenants to get that cleaned off. And um, after the property was cleaned, um, the person selling the property got, received an offer within two weeks. So that was, that was really good. Uh, this is a photo from our uh, um, sign initiative that we uh, we put on back in November following the uh, political season. So we noticed that there were a lot of complaints um, from um, various folks around town um, just regarding temporary signs in general. So we decided that we would dedicate some time to going out and dropping off some information to business owners about the ordinance and then following back up in a few weeks to, you know, ask them about compliance and get that moving. So uh, you guys recognize this spot, uh, Gibbs Tobacco uh, or the general area. And it turns out when I went in there to speak to each of the tenants, they all told me that they were competing against each other for sign real estate. So when one person stuck a sign out, every other tenant would put a sign out until this is what happened. So I had to kind of tell them, you know, if I make them take their signs out, then everybody else will. And then you guys can each have one and it's gonna look great. 
And uh, it's maintained that same look since everybody took their signs out. So I'm hopeful that it'll, it'll stick that way. Um, yeah, and this one, uh, not really a, a big story behind this, just another, you know, pretty dramatic before and after uh, rental property on the north side of town um, sent a letter and it was mowed within, you know, a couple of days. And again, uh, pretty substantial blackberry bushes. Uh, we have a lot of that around town and um, there are a lot to take care of and get rid of, but um, this property owner spent a pretty long weekend and they removed almost all of them. And there's other patches around the property that they also took care of. So our proactive community <sighs> relations program. So here's what we have in mind um, and what we plan and on doing in the future. So um, we actually already have um, plan to attend a neighborhood, neighborhood um, watch meeting here in March. Um, we really want to just form relationships with active members in the community. We want to be a part of the community. We're not here just to enforce and just to lay the law on residents. We want to help clean up the city and to make it beautiful for everyone to live in and everyone to be proud of saying, I live in the city of McBenville, Oregon. Um, and so we want to um, also attend community events to help educate. The biggest thing for us is education. A lot of the people that I've ran to that have um, code violations, they weren't even aware they, there was such rules or ordinance. Um, you know, so to us, it's just really educating. Education is, will take you a long way. And uh, the proactive community relations programs, again. Um, so another thing we would like to do is we would like to do a community cleanup days. We've seen that this is very successful in other cities um, to try and encourage residents to clean up some of the stuff that they may not be able to get rid of um, throughout the year. Uh, maybe they just don't have the means to it, but we'd like to create a program where um, a couple times a year, you're allowed to maybe <sighs> Um, put a couch on the side of the street and public works and we'll come and pick it up. And we, we really want to try and do it um, by zones throughout the city instead of just trying to focus on cleaning the city and doing a cleanup day, all of it in one day, we'd like to break it down by um, either by weeks or weekends uh, where individuals would be able to help clean up um, the city and um, be able to discard um, some of their garbage that they may have bigger items, like I said, couches, um, discarded furniture, et cetera, um, without having to pay for it. Um, and also Good Samaritan program. And this program is more like neighbors helping neighbors. Um, we really want to set up a group of volunteers um, that will be able to assist elderly and disabled um, individuals to bring properties up to code, like mowing grass. Um, you know, I, I ran into a situation where a disabled resident um, was just um, putting the garbage out and wasn't, didn't have garbage service. And so this would, we would have been able to gather a volunteer and say, hey, this person just needs help taking their garbage to the dump or to Recology. Can you go and collect six bags of garbage that's outside their property? And um, that could have um, helped a lot of, um, a lot in the situation. And I think this slide just kind of touches again on um, our, our proactive approach that uh, we'd like to, you know, continue using visiting the city entirely and not just getting hung up on certain areas that um, tend to be problem areas. Um, so again, that helps us raise awareness of, of the department and the program and the ordinances. Um, and, you know, again, just increases the, the livability of McMinnville. And then uh, lastly, we'll just give you a quick rundown of um, Kind of the calendar, uh, September, October, we submitted um, a, a brochure to be included in Recology's newsletter. So that went out to everyone that had service in McMinnville. Uh, November, uh, December, again, with the uh, non-compliant temporary sign usage. January, February, we rolled out um, our proactive approach to code compliance in the six zones. 
in March and April, we'd like to uh, continue with the strategic neighborhood focuses and figuring out how we might be able to break them down for these neighborhood cleanup days. As we get closer to you know summer and fire season, um, helping folks keep their tall grass and noxious vegetation trimmed down so that's not gonna be a fire hazard. Um, July and August launch some more of these community cleanup assistance programs, neighbors helping neighbors, um, and so on. Questions? Thank you. Um, again, we're running a little over, but any questions uh, for Claudia or Nick or Heather? Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for uh, the code work you've done. And again, we'll look for uh, that to be reviewed by department heads and the legal staff and that coming back. I would uh, suggest that anyone on the council that has uh, questions, uh, now we know code enforcers and, and we can move towards uh, talking with them and with Heather uh, for anything that you'd like to in include in, in the, uh, the code itself. Heather, Claudia, Nick, thank you so very much. And um, we'll go ahead and close this portion of our meeting. And why don't we just take about three minutes uh, if you want to take your plates in.